Hi guys, this is Rich. I am going to record the next section that I've been assigned this year. This is from the content specs, um, image production, equipment, operation, and quality assurance. On page 7, this is 2B, <clears throat> 1 through 6. And it has to do with quite a number of terms that we use in relationship to uh, digital imaging and digital imaging processing. So we're going to talk to some extent about all of these individual topics. We'll talk about pre-processing of the image. We'll talk about um, what that pre-processing does and uh, correcting the data. And then the corrected data is sent to our monitor for display. Uh, if we like it, we can send it immediately to PAX, or if not, there are some further manipulations that we as technologists can um, apply to the image. Uh, and this is not to say that it ends there. There's also some post-processing um, aspects that doctor can uh, do on the image, measurements, whatnot, and changing the window and level on their monitor uh, to visualize details that they might want to see. We'll talk in generalities about display monitors, uh, the types that we have and a bit about them. I'm going to talk in more detail about uh, display monitors and the quality control for uh, display monitors uh, when we get together in another week or so and uh, we talk and we have a live lecture. And then finally, at the end, I'm going to uh, just remind you of some of the imaging informatics aspect of it. Obviously, digital imaging is dependent on computers. And so we'll talk a bit about these uh, uh, computer systems that contribute um, or that PAX contributes to, including picture archive communication system, hospital information system, and radiology information system. As you know, they are not the same thing. We'll talk about digital imaging and communication in medicine and why that's important. And finally, how the electronic medical record or electronic health record is sort of encompassing a lot of these and making a more streamlined system. So that being said, here we go. Let's talk about raw data, the pre-processing aspect of how the computer gets ready to receive the data from the X-ray exposure that we just uh, exposed. And there's a couple of things that we can do to correct the field or level the playing field prior to uh, displaying the image. And those will include rescaling and flat fielding and dead pixel correction. So let's talk about those. Understand that in the analog to digital conversion, the ADC, the digital images are actually images that have been converted into numerical values for transmission and processing. That's necessary because digital imaging works with data. So we need to take our x-ray exposure and we need to quantify that into some format that the computer can work with. And so what we do is we change all of those various uh, levels of grayscale that have, we have been able to collect, and we'll change them into numbers. And by doing that, then we have something that's universal that the computer can work with. So we need to take that analog signal and turn it into a digital signal. And that happens through the uh, analog to digital converter. It consists of two steps, sampling of the signal and then assigning the numbers that are representative of those levels of exposure. And that's quantification or quantization of, the, um, of those values. So sampling occurs when the analog signal is changed to a digital signal. And what happens is that the computer recognizes those analog levels because those are light of some kind and it will assign not an arbitrary number but it will assign a number based on what it thinks is the best representation of that gray scale 
so to ensure reconstruction of the original image as close as possible to the original signal and no resolution of image is lost from the analog to digital conversion. So the computer tries to be very, very specific about exactly which shade of gray should be assigned to that. All right, that being said, sampling then can take place uh, in various uh, aspects of depending on which which uh, method we are obtaining our image. Let's take, for instance, CR, computed radiography. And from, for computed radiography, um, where sampling takes place is when the uh, photostimulable phosphor plate is being scanned with the laser beam and visible blue-purple light is being emitted and that's being collected by the photomultiplier tube. And so it is at that point that the computer is recognizing those various levels of exposure. And as that process moves along, then those various levels of exposure are assigned a numerical or digital number. And that digital number is going to be binary number. Um, we talked a little bit about binary system being a system of zeros and ones. And so we take that very, very uh, extreme, a lot of exposure, very little attenuation, and we can assign that a number, and that's going to be representative of a lot of exposure. Or we take something that's very light, which did not receive a lot of exposure, and similarly, we can assign that a digital number as well. So the process of turning those numbers representative of the amount of exposure, this is a part of sampling. Now, you remember Nyquist, and Nyquist uh, sampling must include at least twice the number of pixels needed to form the image, must, and it must be sampled that that rate or resolution will be lost. So this is to say that as we are collecting that data, we need to collect it at a level that is frequent enough so that we are able to, we have confidence that those sampled numbers, when they are reproduced as our digital image, are going to be representative of what the anatomy really looks like. If we don't, when the spatial frequency is greater than the Nyquist frequency and sampling occurs at less than twice per cycle, what happens is we get a alias or a um, artifact. Information is lost and results in a Moray effect where two superimposed images result that are slightly out of alignment. And so this is that wavy kind of pattern. Um, perhaps you have seen a Moray effect on some of your X-ray images for a variety of different reasons. Okay, and um, often they occur um, when we have used a grid in relationship to our um, image. Uh, and this is especially true in the CR system if our grid lines have run parallel to the way that the uh, image plate has been scanned, then we get an image that is slightly out of alignment uh, and conceivably we would get a moray effect. And so they're really, they don't, really enhance your radiograph. Uh, and typically, when you have a Moray effect, you are going to have to repeat that image. All right, so quantization then, the assignment of that numeric value for each pixel bit depth. Remember, bit depth, that controls the number of gray shades and therefore the contrast resolution. And bit depth is not something that we as technologists can choose. Bit depth is uh, sort of hardwired into the system, and it's hardwired into the system, and the computer can recognize it. And then based on the bit depth, how many gray scales is appropriate for this particular body part? Now, a couple of examples, not to make this too difficult. Uh, for a chest x-ray, we would want conceivably more gray levels. So we would conceivably want 
to process our image at a higher bit depth than we would need, for instance, for a um, AP and lateral hip x-ray, for instance, because we're not looking necessarily for all of those subtle tonal graduations of grayscale in a hip as we are in a chest. So, the assignment of these numeric values for each pixel bit depth, and that controls the number of gray shades, and that controls the contrast resolution. And that is, occur, that is uh, accomplished by the process of quantization, where the computer takes those gray levels and assigns that numeric value which is a binary digit. Did we talk a bit about uh, binary um, bits and bytes? A bit is going to be a zero or a one. And then if we take uh, um, up to eight of those individual bits, if we take eight of them, then we can represent a tremendous number um, of more data. <clears throat> and that is known as a byte. Will that be on the National Board Certifying Exam? I don't know, but it is in the content specs. And so you should know at least, you know, uh, uh, have a fundamental understanding of this stuff. Will they give you a number and ask you to turn it into a, a digital binary number, uh, that kind of conversion? I don't think that that's something that you really need to worry about. Um, if you were a computer scientist, if you were a researcher in this stuff, then that might be different. But for purposes of, uh, for purposes of becoming a, te a technologist, I think that this slide will probably take you as far as you really need to go. Understand that grayscale bit depth, that's the number of shades of gray in the digital image pixel. Uh, that uh, individual pixels can represent tremendous number of grayscale because it's that sensitive and it will capture that data. An example of bit depth, remember that we have, um, we represent bit depth by 2 to an exponential power. And so 2 to the 12th power is 4096 different shades of gray. If we go to the 14th power and the 16th power and on, though we can capture that many more shades of gray. Uh, but that's not necessary for all kinds of exams. I think that the highest bit depth that we're practically using um, in today's uh, market is for mammography. All right, so moving on, let's talk about the raw data, another aspect of uh, pre-processing. There's a couple of things that happen during pre-processing. And algorithms, algorithms are mathematical computations that are set for, we bring in some numbers and then we process those numbers with an algorithm, which is sort of a uh, mathematical computation. But the thing about algorithms is that they have a beginning point and they have an ending point and they don't get into a continuous loop and an endless cycle. So there's a definite beginning and a definite ending, and then that's the answer. So what's happening in pre-processing? Well, one of the things that we have is an image histogram, and I'm going to talk about histogram here in a second. But essentially, the image histogram needs to take a look at all of that data, and it makes some value judgments about it, and this is the data that we use to form the image. So the image histogram, uh, histogram analysis and creation is a part of pre-processing. Now, simultaneously, but in a separate process, detector defects are removed. And they are removed through a process called either um, flat fielding or gain calibration. I think the two terms are synonymous. And I'll talk about that here in a second. I have an example of that where we level the playing field, if you will, and we get rid of all of the imperfections, uh, kind of like vacuuming the carpeting and vacuuming all of those uh, specks of dust 
and dirt and, uh, you know, the dog food that you spilled on the carpet. Uh, and all of that just makes it a nice flat uh, carpeting again. We have um, rescaling, automatic rescaling will also take that data that we sent it and it will process it in a certain way so that what we have sent to the computer uh, as our raw data is further processed in an algorithm and uh, a different result comes out. And this is uh, controlled by based on the lookup table that we have selected, and I'll get into that as well. I have dead pixel correction. Uh, dead pixel correction is that, remember, there's a lot of pixels on your image plate, right? So let's just take a matrix. I worked this math out. I can't see it in my head. But um, let's take a matrix of 512 by 512. And that turns into like 262,144 pixels. And that's a lot. And can you imagine that uh, the CR plates, as you remember, they're reusable up to 10,000 times. So the 8,453rd time that we use that plate, well, not all of those pixels are usable anymore. They have succumb to you know various reasons and they're not working so well anymore or perhaps the same thing is true of our uh, flat panel detector and the pixels right along the periphery some of them are no longer usable well we can fix those dead pixels not to make them work again but we can make a value judgment about what level, what grayscale would have been there had they been working. And we can make that value judgment based on the intensity and the numerical data of the pixels right around the one that isn't sending any data. And so this is a dead pixel correction. Uh, we can also have various software uh, solutions to correct for noise. Uh, we, where we can eliminate that noise. And so let's talk about these a bit more. Uh, the pre-processing occurs prior to the image being displayed. So when we make our exposure, then a whole lot of things are happening all at once. Okay, the raw images, the raw data is not necessarily used in diagnosis, but we process that raw data to create our final image. And so the process of pre-processing, if you will, is designed to produce an artifact-free artifact digital image that is representative of the anatomy. Okay, And this happens automatically in the background. We don't have to set it up. It's just a part of the histogram analysis it's just a part of rendering the digital image from the latent image to the manifest image. By the time we get the manifest image showing up on our screen, then this is already done, and there it is. Now, what would you like to do with that image, technologist? Some of the pre-processing corrections that we have are rescaling, our flat fielding, and dead pixel correction. As I look at these three uh, aspects. <clears throat> First one is not rescaling. We're going to do flat fielding and uh, dead. First, we're going to do flat fielding and gain calibration so that we have a nice even playing field, a nice clean carpet. And then we're going to recognize whether or not we're, we have any dead pixels and we'll recognize those dead pixels. And so we'll be in a position to make those uh, value judgments as to what we need to do to it. And then finally, we have rescaling. Rescaling happens a little later in the process. And here's what happens with rescaling. This helps to maintain consistent image brightness and contrast despite overexposure and underexposure. Sometimes that happens that we, uh, we have a particularly uh, slender patient and we may have slightly overexposed our image. 
And so in that case, the computer, uh, digital imaging, as you know, has a great deal of, of flexibility for that. And despite the fact that we have overexposed our image, the computer, these um, algorithms say, well, not that big a deal. I can compensate for that. And so it rescales the image on the basis of comparison histograms to display the proper pixels for the area of interest. And these um, comparison histograms, this is the lookup table. The lookup table is when we have selected, okay, this is Jimmy John's um, hip x-ray and um, it's an AP hip x-ray. And so the computer looks through the file and says, okay, AP hip x-ray, I have in my data file the perfect exposure for an AP hip x-ray. And I'm going to compare that to the technologist just sent me what they say is an AP hip x-ray. And so how closely does the data match what I think it ought to be? And by virtue of comparing that, then the computer is able to go through a process of bringing my x-ray image up to the level of what is a perfect x-ray image for that particular body part. And so that's automatic rescaling. Quantum model. Well, you know about quantum model. I hope you don't have much experience in it, but I'm sure that you have seen it on occasion during the last two years. And that results from underexposure. Typically what happens is we don't have enough MAS. So we get an image that is um, contrast and density. They look okay, but... Uh, we recognize that it's underexposed by virtue of the fact that it's not very sharp. There's like little holes in the image. It's pixelated. And so this is quantum model. Overexposure on the other side of, the, uh, of that uh, field is a loss of contrast and distinct edges because of increased scatter. So if we overexpose our image, Again, we don't get a, we don't necessarily get a good image. Uh, there are, it is prone to some problems, which may be a loss of contrast, which may be uh, the influence of scatter, which is giving us additional density, uh, which is give, decreasing our spatial resolution. Uh, in the case of extreme overexposure, then as you remember, we may get something called data drop where the detectors are so oversaturated that there isn't um, very much contrast at all. And we may, not even, uh, we may not even see the anatomy there. Suddenly there's holes in the bone. And so if we, the computer, as you remember, can compensate for a great deal of overexposure, but there is a limit. The computer can also compensate for some level of underexposure, but again, there is a limit. So automatic rescaling allows for dose creep uh, based on automatic processes. Dose creep, as you remember, is not the name of your pet parakeet. Dose creep is the tendency of technologists to overexpose um, an image so that they don't have so that they run don't run the risk of underexposing it because they know that there's more flexibility in an overexposed image than there is with an underexposed image this is not a good practice um, and i want to encourage you guys to uh, be a better technologist than that be a better technologist than the technologists that you have been working with in the hospital who do subscribe to dose creep don't be that guy. Moving on. Flat fielding or gain calibration. Again, those terms are synonymous. And this is designed to make the image receptor um, uniform in its response to the image. It's used to correct flaws in the detector. It can be used if a large area of the detector has dead pixels or if the detector has poor connections and artifacts are seen for a variety of different uh, reasons. It removes these densities 
on the image by creating a mask of those known defects and then it takes and applies that mask to to subtract out of the image those areas that it knows are um, not representative of the anatomy and so it kind of cleans it up if you will and it does it electronically so this is flat fielding or gain calibration here's an example of flat fielding um, and this is as a result of the anode heel effect. As you remember, the anode heel effect is uh, the tendency of more than uh, more exposure to occur on the cathode side of the X-ray tube and less exposure on the anode side of the X-ray tube. And so therefore, we get overall um, a, an exposure of between, say, 80% and 120% of what we have set. And if we were to, um, if we were to demonstrate that, our image might look like A, where there on the left side of the image, as you look at it, is the anode side, and on the, um, uh, on the other side is the cathode side. So flat, uh, flat fielding will take that anode heel effect and it will create a mask of that and it will eliminate that artificial um, artifact from the image and it corrects the defect to make the image receptor response uniform. And this happens, as I say, um, in the background. This is not something that we have to apply. It's just a part of the pre-processing um, things that happen automatically. Dead pixel correction. Malfunctioning or dead pixels can result from dust, from scratches, static discharge, chemical corrosion, oh my goodness, or interaction between materials. The number of dead pixels increases as the detector ages. This is a known fact. It, um, uh, our imaging uh, receptors are reusable thousands of times, but this is not to say that they are 100% uh, like new every time we use them. It's the same idea as when you buy a new car. After 10 years, it's no longer a new car. It's a 10-year-old car. These um, pixels and these image plates are manufactured to maintain the standard of 0.1 to 0.2 percent of defective pixels. So remember that matrix that I talked about 262,144 pixels? Well, one percent of that is like 2,000 out of 262,000. And so you can see that uh, 2,000 one percent is not a tremendous amount. And if we can maintain that between one and two percent, well then that would be um, that would be pretty close tolerance. And as I look at this, this is like one tenth of one percent. And so that's even fewer pixels. And so if we can build them to withstand that tolerance, then we should get a good life expectancy from them, despite the fact <clears throat> that there are some known dead pixels, defective pixels in there. So the software is built to identify and to isolate these dead pixels. And then a process called interpolation, which I alluded to earlier, fills in the dead pixels with information using the surrounding pixels as a guide. Okay, so if we uh, have a number of dead pixels right there in the middle of the lung field, well, we're going to fill those dead pixel holes in with a similar grayscale from the area around it versus if we're right in the spine, um, then we would fill in those pixels with um, grayscale of representative of that area of the image receptor. So that's how that automatically works. A histogram. This is an important part of it. I, as I said, I don't know what's on the National Board Certifying Exam, but I am willing to bet that there will be some questions about histogram. So understand what a histogram is. It's just a graph. 
and that graph represents the data set of the densities um, that are representing the numerical values of your radiograph. So the histogram does a couple of important things for us. First and foremost, it's used to identify the edges of an image and assess the raw data prior to image display. The histogram is going to scan or uh, is going to take a look at all of the data from the image that you sent it. And that may be in the CR plate or that may be with the DR plate. And one of the things that the histogram is responsible for is looking at the edges of the image. Remember, we taught you for four-sided collimation. And best case scenario, we would put that four-sided collimation in the center of the image receptor. That makes it easy on the histogram to say, aha, okay, there's the image right in the center, just where I expect it to be. And so it will um, identify that as the image uh, that it wants to process and anything outside of those columnated edges it'll just ignore them and so that helps us that helps the digital imaging to display our data so the computer analyzes the histogram using processing algorithms remember an algorithm it starts it stops and it's done and compares it with a pre established histogram specific to the anatomic part being imaged. That's that lookup table. The models of the lookup table have a shape characteristic of selected anatomic region and projection. And what that means is that they have the data um, etched into them. Okay, etched isn't the right word. They have the data representative of what is a perfect AP hip. What is a perfect AP spine? What is a perfect swimmer's projection? And it's going to compare the data that I sent it to the perfect data on my lookup table. Okay, and so we need to uh, we need to put our image into binary format so that we can compare apples to apples. Now the histogram, the value of each gray tone value represents the horizontal axis. You have seen these graphs before. I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but I'm up here in the upper right and I'm looking at A and I am looking at the um, histogram and the histogram you can see, come here mouse, you can see that down here in the corner, zero and zero is a lot of exposure and, and it's represented, I'm sorry, I may be backwards here. I'm looking at um, some very little exposure in these lower, uh, on this X axis. And as we start to have more and more exposure, then I'm starting to see an increased number of those pixels captured. So the value of each gray tone is represented on the horizontal axis, and the number of each of those gray tones is represented on the vertical axis. Okay, and so based on that low energy, uh, low energy, low KV values, create a wider histogram. Wider histogram for low energy, lower KV, and we have less contrast. High energy, higher KV creates a narrower histogram. And I know that this is kind of difficult to wrap your brain around, so I want to encourage you to, um, to have a look in Carlton and or Bouchon for a bit better explanation of this. One of the things that I think may be on the board exam, and I cannot say this with certainty, is that the shape of the histogram is anatomy specific. This is to say that um, everybody's chest x-ray, PA chest x-ray uh, histogram looks essentially similar, even if it's me and you and the man on the moon. But everybody's PA chest x-ray does not look anything like their AP knee x-ray, does not look anything like a toe x-ray. So the shape of the histogram is always anatomy specific. 
Okay, and so uh, that's this is another way to say that we want to select the correct lookup table to process our image because if we select a um, if we select a sternum lookup table to process our um, knee x-ray, we're not going to get the results that we might uh, ordinarily expect to have. All right, so let's take that data then and let's correct it to some extent and get it ready for processing and then for display. So grayscale, I think that uh, we've hit this quite a number of times over the last two years. The number of different shades of gray that can be stored and displayed by a computer system. White on the grayscale is representative of the highest intensity. This is to say that we have, um, it, this is represented of brightness and black is the lowest intensity on the grayscale. Okay, and uh, so on the grayscale, then we have window width and we have window level. They're not the same thing. Window width controls the contrast and the number of shades of gray visible on the image to show anatomy. This controls the ratio of black and white. And so a wider window width, as I just said a minute ago, shows us lower contrast and a narrow window width shows us higher contrast. Don't stress, I have some, uh, I have a couple of other uh, illustrations to help to show this a bit better. Now that's window width and that controls the contrast. The window level controls the brightness, how bright or dark the screen is. So higher brightness, a lighter image. Lower brightness, a darker image. This one is not hard to visualize because this is how we sort of see the world as it works. Window width is a little bit more challenging to wrap your brain around. What do we have for spatial frequency and spatial resolution, which is the detail or the sharpness of the image, the focus, the clarity, the, the um, ability to see these fine details? And as you remember, spatial frequency is measured by line pairs per millimeter. If we can see more line pairs per millimeter, we have better spatial resolution. In digital imaging, sharpness and or contrast can be further controlled by separate processing parameters through spatial frequency filtering. And those are, include edge enhancement and those include smoothing, which is a post processing function that we may or may not want to apply. Okay, and here is, uh, this is edge enhancement or high band pass filtering. Let me get out of my own way so that you can see on this, uh, this is the same picture, yes? Uh, it's the same picture, but we have applied some specialized filtering to it. Now, I'm looking at A, which is a little pinker, and B, which is a little more sunburn, suntanned, if you will. Okay, so as you take a look at this, which one has the edge enhancement or high band pass filtering, which increases the contrast along the edges of the structure and improves the visibility of detail. So this is the spatial resolution. So what I have here is the same image, but I processed it um, with slightly different rules. This is not unlike uh, what you can do in Photoshop, uh, that you can take your digital uh, image and you can massage it to achieve the results that you want. All right, so I'm looking at this one and I'm looking at this one. The one over here on the right side with the increased suntan, this I believe is the original data, okay? But when we come over to the first image, the A, which is pinker, let's take a look. Uh, what can we see uh, that might be a bit different that helps it a little bit? Well, take a look at his hair. 
Okay, can you see the individual strands of hair a bit more clearly? Okay, take a look at the lines underneath his eye. Okay, take a look at the um, uh, the zygomatic arch, for instance. And can you see that uh, I'm seeing a bit more detail in the skin folds. I'm seeing a bit more detail in the hair. I'm seeing um, an increase in the visibility of detail. I'm seeing better spatial resolution. And I've accomplished this electronically. So this is edge enhancement or high band pass filtering. All right, so let me go back to my corner and apply this now to our X-ray image. Here is how we can use edge enhancement. Um, image A on the left side, that looks like a, you know, it's not a wonderful lateral angle, but it certainly shows post-operatively the pins and the uh, plates that are put in place. And if we apply some edge enhancement to that and shift slightly the contrast, which is the same thing that we did back here, then can you see that we have um, artificially, if you will, enhanced the visibility of detail. We've increased the spatial resolution uh, and we have taken this data and further processed it so the doctor can see much more clearly what's going on there. So this is edge enhancement. Okay, edge enhancement sort of brings those sharp edges around so that we can see that much more clearly. Conversely, we can do the same thing with smoothing or low pass filtering by averaging each pixel's frequency with the surrounding pixel values to remove high frequency noise. So take a look at this lumbar spine and can you see that there's a lot of pixelation there? It's almost like quantum model. Okay, and in fact, it might be quantum model, but by applying some low pass filtering, we can smooth that quantum model and we can get a more anatomically pleasing image. Okay, and so from that perspective, smoothing will reduce noise, will also to some extent reduce contrast. And so this is how we can use uh, this post-processing aspect of low pass filtering. I've not seen this used a tremendous number of times in radiology, but I think that this does happen in CT scanning, um, imaging um, larger patients. We get a lot of quantum model in the axial images, especially in the abdomen. And so um, we can apply some smoothing to those images to make them uh, that much better. All right, so the histogram, this is the identification of the useful signal by locating the minimum and maximum signal within the anatomical region of interest. This is another way of saying we're looking for those four sides of collination. Uh, if you don't have four sides of collination, you need to have at least two. If you have no collination whatsoever on your image receptor, then the computer is going to recognize, okay, the whole plate is exposed, so I need to process the entire plate. Okay, and so it will process the entire plate, and that's what you get. As you know, um, by increasing our collimation, by making a smaller field of view, that decreases scatter. And so having four-sided collimation will decrease scatter, will increase the visibility of detail, and give you a much better image. Then this histogram uh, that we have sent it is compared to a reference histogram, which is the lookup table. If the exposure is outside the range from underexposed to overexposed, the computer will correct the image by shifting or rescaling the histogram. And this is in Carlton and Adler, uh, 278.79. Okay, this would be a good thing for you to recognize uh, that um, histogram can do this and lookup tables can do this. Histogram equalization, we can adjust the image intensities to enhance the contrast. 
these uh, don't be put off by these graphs. What we have here is we've taken the graph on the top, which is uh, which is narrow, and we've just made it wider. So it spreads out the intensity values along the total range of values in order to achieve a higher contrast of the image. This is how electronically it works. And so an example of that before and after when we apply uh, equalization to an image, you can see that we have made uh, Dr. Einstein much more visible. Look, we have increased the contrast. I'm going to come over here to this one. And this is sort of overall darker. And I'm seeing a lot of grayscale. Look at uh, the shoulder and the sleeve here, as opposed to the difference here. Now I have the same levels of gray, but I have more space between them. And I also have an overall lighter image and more contrast. He increased the contrast. Okay, We have lost a little bit of the tonal graduation in his face, but by the same token, we have increased the contrast of the image. And so histogram equalization, again, this is something that happens as a part of the process. And this is something that happens uh, that the lookup table is uh, doing for our image. All right, moving on. Uh, if uh, what are we at about 45 minutes here? And so I'm still going. Uh, I've got quite a number of slides to go. So if you need to take a bathroom break, now would probably be the right time to do it. But I'm just going to keep going so you can restart this um, to catch the end of it. Moving on for data for display, we have values of interest. And we also have lookup tables, so we can talk about them in a little more detail. The values of interest determine the range of the histogram data set that should be included on or in your displayed image. Now remember that uh, the histogram, we're going to initially capture all of the shades of gray, the entire image. And then the values of interest in conjunction with the lookup table is going to recognize the minimum and the maximum exposure values for the body part of that histogram. So PH chest is grayer, um, AP hip is more contrasty. And so the values of interest in the lookup table is going to recognize, all right, am I processing this for a hip or am I processing this for a uh, chest. And, oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. The lookup table then will convert the raw data to different numbers to determine the contrast in an image. Okay? Yes, you can explain it this way, but it's probably much more complicated than that. Lookup tables have standard contrast for the exam to give the desired image the contrast for display, okay? And the proper lookup table will provide the proper grayscale regardless of the KVP and the MAS. Now notice that there's an asterisk there. And the asterisk is probably from the perspective that, yes, it will give you the proper grayscale regardless of KV and MAS, but there is a limit at which point it can uh, do that. If we are very, if we are using extraordinarily higher or lower KVP or MAS values, then the computer can compensate, but it can't compensate every time to the extent that we might need it to. And so from this perspective, the lookup table has a lot of flexibility, but it can't perform miracles. It can reverse or invert the image grayscale. And so instead of black and white, we can get white and black. Um, but also remember that the grayscale rendition of a digital image can be changed by using the window width tool. Remember, window width is making more shades of gray. And so we can artificially change that. Or better, doctor can artificially change that at his or her end uh, in the reading room. 
So the lookup table is, uh, is a part of this uh, that is integral to providing us with the data display on our image when it comes up on our monitor the lookup table has been applied and has been compared to what we sent it and this is the best that the computer can process it so do we need to do any further processing on it well perhaps we do and perhaps we don't Displaying the raw data collected during the exposure would create a very low contrast image because remember the digital the image receptor response in the digital model is linear. And as linear, it will capture all of the values straight up 45 degree. Let's see, which way am I going this way? 45 degrees up the scale. Okay. Um, with no contrast until the lookup table is applied. The lookup table is what gives the image the density and the contrast that we would expect to see for that body part. It is for that reason that we want to select the correct lookup table to process our image. The digital image's appearance with respect to contrast varies significantly depending on the lookup table used for processing. And so that is really important. Perhaps you have some experience where you used uh, the wrong lookup table and you did not get the results that you expected. It is important that we choose the correct lookup table uh, to, to finalize our image. And this is the reason why. Our monitors in the technologist area are not as good as doctor's monitors. And I think that you learned that uh, as we came through and we did 134 and you went to the reading room. And as a result of that, uh, it is a doctor's monitor that he or she needs uh, a great deal of variability and a great deal of uh, flexibility uh, to image to uh, display the image and they will slide the uh, window level and window width around so that they can achieve and see what it is that they need to see. But if we have processed the image with the wrong lookup table, then they may not have the full range of data that they might need. So um, if you're doing a pH test, then that's the lookup table that you should use. Even though a breathing lateral T-spine might make a better looking image, uh, it's not on our monitor that that matters. It's on doctors. So here's the lookup table. Uh, and uh, on the left there, we have the low contrast image, which is the raw data. And you can see that it's captured at 40s and 30s. And the lookup table says, yeah, but everything that's on a 40 uh, or thereabouts, we're going to change to 90. And everything that's on 30, we're going to change to 10. And so it takes that low contrast image and it makes it into a higher contrast image, altering the pixel value of a low contrast image to display an image with higher contrast. So here is an example of that. Uh, the image on the left is not unlike the image that we see in um, CR when it comes up initially. You have seen that, haven't you, where slowly the image starts to become visible and we've gotten the uh, costophrenic angles and we've gotten the apices of the lungs and we're feeling pretty good and suddenly the image goes away, just disappears. Oh my goodness, where'd it go? But the split second later, it comes back. And there it is, that image on the right. See how nice that chest x-ray looks because we have applied the lookup table to shift those values to give us a uh, image that has the proper densities and contrast. So essentially, it's like taking that um, linear value of low contrast and applying contrast to it electronically. And that's how digital imaging works. Let's move on and talk about some of the things that we can do uh, with our image after the fact, after it is um, after it is displayed on our monitor. 
And so I have a whole variety of different things that I might be able to do. Well, we've talked about window width and window level. If these are done correctly, there should be very little need to post-process our image at all. Yes, sometimes we need to uh, orient it differently. Sometimes we need to take it from straight to horizontal or even um, turn it over. Uh, and that happens. But adjusting the window width and the window level may remove information from the image that could be critical for the diagnosis. So even though our image does not look necessarily as good as it could on our monitor. I'm going to repeat something that I told you in one of the classes that if your image represents the anatomy and you're satisfied with the, um, the anatomy that you have included on the image and your exposure index number represents the value, it's within tolerance, then you should feel compelled to send that image as is. You should not manipulate it further because generally that does not help and it does take the data and it shifts it so the doctor doesn't have full range of the data that he or she might need. Now I'm not saying that uh, it doesn't hap uh, that, that it uh, I'm not saying that manipulating the image is in all cases a bad thing to do. I am saying that it's a bad habit to get into. And despite the fact that it might not look good for us, it's probably going to look better for doctor. And so from that perspective, we should not change the image before we send it. If it's within tolerance, if it's displaying all of the anatomy, then just send it. The window width changes the contrast. And this is an inverse relationship. As I said, that's kind of hard to wrap your brain around. The window level changes the brightness of the image, and that's a direct relationship. So if we have a window and we open the window, it lets in more light, and that gives us a bit more brightness. And so, you know, we can see that pretty clearly. If we have a window width, then let's take the sliding window and open the slider, and that changes the contrast of the image, uh, lets in more grayscale, more color, if you will. So window level, level, moving the level up to a high pixel value increases the visibility of the darker regions like the lung fields by increasing the overall brightness on the display monitor. And so to better visualize an anatomic region represented by a low pixel value, we would decrease the window level to decrease the brightness on the display monitor. And so this is window level, the overall brightness. Window level, the brightness level displayed on the computer monitor can be easily altered to visualize the range of the recorded anatomic structures. And it's uh, pretty easy to do. There's a slider and we could move it up and down <clears throat> so that we can see, uh, we can see better. Okay. Typically, we as technologists don't do that. There may be some occasions that uh, we might want to, but, um, by and large, no, that's not something that we need to do because our images are pretty well processed uh, when they come out initially. The window level or the center sets the midpoint of the range of brightness visible in the image. And changing the window level will allow the image brightness to be increased or decreased throughout the entire image. And so the way that works is... Um, I like I like this graph. What I have here is on the top the subject tissue density in relationship to the image brightness. And so when we're imaging air, we have very little density. And as a result, the image brightness that we get representative on our image is black. And then as we come down to fat, 
Well, fat does attenuate a little bit, but not much. So we're going to get very dark shades of gray. Water then um, is a little denser than fat. Muscle is a little denser than water. And then as we come down into bone, well, we have a lot of tissue density with bone. And so the image brightness that we get is brighter white. So this is a direct relationship between the window level and the uh, image brightness. Increasing the window level increases the image brightness. Decreasing the window level decreases the image brightness. Okay, now hold that thought. Let's talk about window width. A narrow or decreased window width displays higher radiographic contrast, whereas a wider increased window width displays lower radiographic contrast. So as we have a wider uh, window width, we have more gray scale. And this is, uh, this may help to explain it. There's an inverse relationship between window width and image contrast. Wide window width, my window width in this case is wide from here to here. Okay, and so when we have a wide window width, we have lower contrast. If I were to take that window width and make it more narrow, more narrow from like here up to just here, then I would have a more narrow window width. And that is going to give me a higher contrast. So here on the bottom, the center or midpoint of the window level and the window width determine the brightness and the contrast of the displayed image. So window level is overall brightness. Window width is grayscale. Again, I want to encourage you, both Bouchang and Carlton, talk about this ad nauseum. Okay, and so please be aware of the difference between window width and between window level. <clears throat> Talking about region of interest, this is a common measurement for the radiologist to use. This determines the pixel density of a certain area. So we can, on a digital image, remember that's been quantified by a number and that quantification is representative of how much exposure got through that, which means that that's, uh, that's a way that we can determine pretty much what was the density of that structure. And so doctor can put a region of interest, select a small area of that of that uh, structure that he or she sees, and they can quantify it by what was the number of the density on that. And that can help determine the solid, uh, whether it's something solid or whether it's fluid due to the differentiating intensities of that. This is commonly done with the CT scanner, uh, but there's no reason why we cannot do it uh, also with digital radiography as well. Like for instance, if we see a lesion in the lung, well, we can do a region of interest on that and that can help to determine in, in concert with the clinical history of the patient, what disease process is likely going on there. We talked a bit about electronic cropping and masking or shuttering. And this affects the data set by removing undesirable information to improve the image quality. This can be performed automatically by systems through edge detection software. Well, we have edge detection software automatically happening in there, and that's a part of the histogram analysis. So the histogram recognizes one, two, three, four sides of collimation, says, okay, everything outside of this box I'm just going to get rid of it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to use it at all. Okay. The computer analyzes the data distribution, looks for the edges of the radiation exposure, and then everything outside of that is applied with black overlays. Not even interested in that data. Don't care what the numbers are. It's 
it's not going into my image. And this protects the uh, viewer's light or viewer's eyes from something called veil glare. I don't know if Christy talked about veil glare, uh, but that is taking a small x-ray image. Remember x-ray view boxes? Remember those lights? So if you took a uh, 8 by 10 or a 10 by 12 image uh, piece of x-ray film and put it up on the bright white light, you have a bright white light and a small 10 by 12 or 8 by 10 x-ray. And so all of this light is coming in and it's difficult to see the bright light as well as the darker x-ray. So that's veil glare. If we take all of this bright white light and we put shutters on it, then what we have is shielding the viewer's eyes. And so it makes it much more pleasant to uh, look at the image and we can see it that much better. <clears throat> so shuttering can remove areas of brightness surrounding the radiation exposed field. It can remove regions within the radiation exposed field that provide no useful information. Like for instance, if we have um, if we have exposed, oh, let's see. All right, I'm going to take a pediatric patient who was not very cooperative. And so I left my columnator open, not up and down for the PHS x ray, but side to side on the PHS x ray. And then I can shutter in east and west to eliminate some of that darker area that has no useful information, that has no anatomy on it. And that will improve the visibility of the, of the image. It has no effect on the image resolution or on the patient um, exposure. And electronic masking should never be used as a substitute for collimation. You guys know better than that. Uh, and again, don't be that guy. Uh, Shuttering is useful to eliminate areas of the image that don't have any anatomy on them, but that should be the extent of it. Subtraction. This is also a post-processing technique that can remove superimposed structures so that the anatomical area of interest becomes more visible. This is because the image is in a digital format and the computer can subtract selected brightness values to create an image without some of these superimposed structures. We don't use this on a regular basis, but this is used very commonly in interventional radiology, for instance, when they do um, images of blood flow and they follow the contrast through uh, the veins or through the arteries. For instance, we can take a x-ray image of the cervical spine and we can use that as a mask and then when we take uh, subsequent images exactly the same while the contrast is going uh, up through the uh, the arteries on the way to the carotid arteries to the bifurcation of the internal and the external carotid artery and then up into the circle of Willis and into the cranium by subtracting then our initial x-ray image which had the bony anatomy on it what we're left with is just an image of the blood vessels with the contrast in it so the way it kind of works here is subtracting from this chest x-ray, I can subtract the bony architecture and I'm left with the lungs, or I can subtract the lungs and I'm left with the bony architecture. So this is a post-processing technique uh, that can be done in some cases. We also have inversion uh, where we in reverse black and white to white and black. <clears throat> and this reverses the grayscale from the original radiograph from, say, a plus or a positive radiograph to a negative radiograph. And this is called inversion. This is not called subtraction. Subtraction is uh, different 
which I talked about just a minute ago. What else do we have? We have contrast enhancement, a post-processing technique that alters the pixel values to increase the image contrast. Um, it's uh, not controlled by KVP because, as you know, uh, KVP is influential but not the defining factor of contrast in the digital image. But the lookup tables determine the contrast of the digital image. An image overexposed by more than 200%, oh my god, will have lower contrast because of scatter radiation. Imaging plates and flat panel detectors must be properly exposed. Yes, there's a great deal of flexibility, but best case scenario is that you uh, have enough experience that you're going to select the best KV range <clears throat> and uh, be sure that your positioning is spot on so that the equipment um, performs with the expectation that you have of it. If you have overexposed by more than 200%, well, you probably have an exposure index that represents that you're out of tolerance. And uh, that needs to, you need to determine how that happened and try not to ever do that again. And here is contrast enhancement. Um, by artificially changing the contrast here. So I'm looking at image A and I have a longer scale contrast typical of chest radiography. And as I look at this image, I'm given to, I'm gonna make an assumption here that um, it looks kind of underexposed to me. The lung fields look okay, but I'm not seeing the tonal graduation in the uh, shoulders and the bony architecture and, and the soft tissues around the chest field. Uh, I'm going to assume that they are there, but I'm not seeing them here. However, taking a look at image B, the contrast has been adjusted to represent a higher scale of contrast. So we have more contrast and look what's now visible are the soft tissues. I'm seeing the trachea, I'm seeing the carina um, much better. I am seeing ribs through the shadow of the heart much better at the expense of the lungs themselves. So contrast enhancement is available to us, but it's not something that we would typically or routinely do to our images before we send them. Display monitors. Uh, we have viewing conditions and we have spatial resolution of these display monitors. So let's take a look at the viewing conditions. Uh, most monitors are, are used to be CRTs, which were the big TV sort of things. And these are now almost obsolete. The cathode ray tubes are still around, but they're not around um, very prevalently. What we now have are liquid crystal display LCD monitors, and those are the most common. We also have organic light emitting diode monitors, which is a manifestation of the LCD. It's uh, advanced to some extent, and I think that I will talk about them uh, a bit in my live lecture in the next week or so. Uh, the more pixels or the larger the matrix in an image results in a higher resolution of the monitor. <coughs> So pixels, uh, just like they were important for spatial resolution in the image, are also important for spatial resolution to represent them uh, based on how many pixels do we are we able to display in the monitor. The more pixels, the better the uh, spatial resolution. So image quality is based on the resolution. Higher resolution monitors preferred for diagnosis. Doctor's monitor, as you remember when you went to the reading room, doctor's monitor is the best in the department. Our monitors on the floor are representative of what we need to see. And we need to see our positioning and we need to see the image with enough clarity that we can make a value judgment whether or not it's an image of quality and whether we are comfortable sending it to PACS. 
but doctor needs to have the best monitor because he or she is staking their professional reputation on making a determination of the pathology that is or is not demonstrated on that image. So that requires that they have the best monitor. Resolution, uh, higher resolution monitors preferred for diagnosis. Luminance. Luminance is, uh, this affects contrast so that the monitor should have adequate amount of light from all areas. Luminance is the light that's coming from the monitor. It's how much brightness are, is being transmitted out in so that we can see it. <clears throat> the contrast of monitors should be the same on all viewing monitors to ensure grayscale is consistent in the department. Uh, and so this is to say that if um, the standard is 5K monitors in the reading room, then all of the monitors in that department, conceivably, we've set the standard. And so that should uh, we should maintain that standard. Bit depth, higher bit depth yields higher contrast resolution. Remember contrast resolution having to do with the number of grays that are available. And then finally, avoiding veil glare. Electronic masking helps with um, eliminating veil glare. Viewing angle. I'm pretty sure that I talked about that viewing angle is important from the perspective that viewers, physicians, and others should have direct access viewing to avoid poor angles and degrading the image contrast. During um, LCD viewing, field of view gradually deteriorates as the viewer moves away from the center of the screen. So you are looking right now at your screen and you are looking at me. But if I'm over here looking, I don't see the screen quite as well. Wait, let me see. No, that doesn't really help it much either. So best case scenario is when the physician is reading it, when the physician is consulting with another physician, they should be right at the screen looking at it perpendicular to the screen, perpendicular to the screen. And that gives us the best viewing conditions of that image. If we come from the side to side, then that does not increase the visibility. That does not enhance the image. That detracts from the image. Ambient light. Well, once again, I'm going to take you back to the reading room. And it was dark in there, wasn't it? And, uh, and if there was light, it was a very low level because ambient lighting reflections on the monitor will have a negative impact on the contrast. This is... This was especially true when we had cathode ray tubes because they had a big curved face and they were prone to lots of glare. Now the LCD monitors that we have, they are flat panel and they don't have that shiny glass surface. They have a muted glass surface, so we don't have the glare that um, necessarily was a problem. So we can um, reduce the amount of glare that's on, uh, that's shining on our monitors. Uh, it can be reduced, but it cannot be eliminated. We cannot eliminate 100% of the glare. We can take it down to the level that it is not objectionable, that it doesn't appreciably attract from the image. Um, but um, we should be aware of the fact that even a little bit of glare may, in some cases, have some minor effect on it. Monitors should not be used in rooms with ambient or bright lighting. And so that's why the radiologist reading rooms are always dark. Now, they're not cave blackness, but as you recall, there might be one small light in that area. And some of the light that's coming uh, from the radiologist reading room is light as a result of the luminance of the monitor itself. The, uh, the screen displaying the image also creates some light in the room. 
what do we have here? Spatial resolution. The pixel is the basic picture element of digital imaging. And so the number of pixels equals the spatial resolution. Remember that more pixels in the same area give us higher spatial resolution. This is going to be true not only with the image receptor, but also with the monitor. <clears throat> What's a matrix? A matrix is just a table of rows and columns to give the image form. It's like a piece of graph paper. And the larger the matrix size, the higher the spatial resolution. What do we have? Pixel pitch, the physical distance between pixels measured from the center to the center of each pixel. So smaller pixel pitch is higher spatial resolution. And here's the reason why. If I have a pixel here and a pixel here, I have a pixel pitch of that much. But if I have a pixel here and a pixel here, then I have less pixel pitch. And so high, smaller pixel pitch, higher spatial resolution. And this is determined by the detector element or the D DEL, which is a detector element. Also remember, we talked a bit about fill factor. Fill factor is the sensing area, uh, the percentage of the, of the digital image receptor that has the sensing area uh, to, um, to capture the data of the values of exposure. And so we have higher spatial resolution when we have a higher fill factor. Common screen resolutions, 1280 by 1024. Uh, then we have 1600 by 1200. You can see that we have more resolution with the 2K monitor, um, but not as much as we have for 3K and for 5K monitors. So when we have more pixels in the same physical size, then we have better spatial resolution. Brightness. Brightness is a measurement of the luminance, luminance being the light that's coming from the screen, of an area in a radiographic image that's displayed on the monitor. And this is calibrated in units of candela per square meter. Candela is the standard, um, uh, is the way that we describe how much light, how, what is our luminance value. Will that be on the National Board Certifying Exam? I don't know. I know that Candela and luminance are in at least one of the board review books. And so from that perspective, I guess it's fair game. Uh, so be aware of the terms and the difference between luminance and Candela. And this is the brightness is manipulated by the window level. Okay, window level, brightness, window width, contrast. There it is, contrast, the visible difference between any two selected areas of brightness levels within the displayed radiographic image. And that's primarily determined by the processing algorithm, by the lookup table. And it's manipulated by the window width in our digital images. All right, coming to the end here, uh, let's talk a little bit about imaging informatics. And I think that you guys have been working with this stuff for uh, enough time that most of it has probably seeped in to your uh, consciousness. So we'll start with DICOM, which is Digital Imaging and Communication in Medicine. This is a universally accepted standard for exchanging medical images among modalities, viewing stations, and archive. This is the standard for uh, images. Okay. Um, let me see. How can I put this? Okay. If we wanted to, uh, when we're taking uh, images with our digital camera or even with our phone, um, we save those in a standard called JPEG, for instance. And JPEG is the standard for uh, pictures. Okay. If we're looking for a um, audio recording, then that's typically, well, 
I don't know if it's changed now, but it has been for a long time an MP3. And video file is an MP4. And this is the universal accepted standard. For medical images, we save them and transmit them as files that we call DICOM. And DICOM is the standard for handling, storing, printing, and transmitting these medical images. So if we have a um, unit, our medical imaging digital radiography unit, our CT unit, our MRI ultrasound, uh, our printer, all of them are able to speak and understand DICOM. And so by virtue of that, this is the standard. And here's the cool thing. See where it says universally accepted? That means that my CT scan that I did on a Toshiba scanner, I can show it on a GE scanner because it's universally accepted standard. So DICOM enables the integration of scanners, servers, workstations, printers, and network hardware for multiple manufacturers. And this, I believe that we are presently in the DICOM 3 standard. I cannot say that with certainty, but understand that DICOM is universally accepted and all medical images and medical imaging equipment speak and understand DICOM. Picture Archive and Communication System is a network of various computers and imaging modalities. Uh, and this has revolutionized what we do in radiology and how we do it. Okay, we have at its core is the PAX uh, archive server. And this is the repository for all of our images. Okay, and images not only in radiography, but also for all of the other imaging modalities. And we can save them electronically. And then from the server, well, we can send and receive information from workstations so the doctor can read it. We can, let's go the other way, we can communicate with radiology information system and hospital information system so that we have access to patient demographic data and also patient history so that we can save reports and tie our reports to the radiology information system or the hospital information system. Um, and this will also uh, interface with the electronic medical record. Um, the individual modalities can be sent back and forth from the um, archive server uh, out to the modality, or the modality can send today's study to the archive server. Can we make a paper copy of an x-ray image? And the answer is yes, we need to send it to a printer, or we can make a, a CD of the uh, or a DVD of today's imaging study, and we can burn that on a disk. And so that also needs to speak DICOM. And so you can see that this is how PAX works. It's a networked group of computers, servers, and archives that can be used to manage digital imaging. And it can accept anything uh, to manage the digital imaging format. It serves as a file room, it serves as a reading room, it serves as a duplicator and a courier. And it's not necessarily specific to just the four walls of our hospital. It can, um, if we uh, have access to the internet and we can log into the internet, we can log into our PAX server and this is how doctor can read images at off hours at perhaps his or her home. This is also how uh, physicians in other countries can read uh, our images based on the fact that it's electronic. We don't have any film that we need to take. Uh, we can just bring it up immediately on the computer. And this is, as I said, this has really revolutionized medicine and brought us into the current century and made our health care, not only for our country, but for around the world, much better.
provides image access to multiple users at the same time, on-demand images, electronic annotation of images, and specialty image processing. And all of this can happen independently at various uh, workstations. So PAX is a good thing. How does that interface with the radiology information system? Uh, the RIS holds all of the radiology specific patient data and that includes patient scheduling as well as dictated and transcribed reports. So why is this important? So okay let me give you a scenario. You are very sick and you are in the intensive care unit and doctor is very worried about you and quite frankly I am also. Uh, doctor decides that the best thing that we can do for you today is a portable chest x-ray. And so the unit secretary or the unit clerk will put a x-ray request in to the hospital information system. And that is broadcast out to all of the individual downstream systems. And so ICU HIS says, I have a request for this x-ray student who's in ICU bed number four. Is anybody interested? And dietary's computer says, nope, not interested. And the lab computer says, um, I would be interested if it were a blood draw, but for a chest x-ray, I don't care. And then, um, oh, let's see, where else? Surgery, well, they're much too busy. Um, They've got a lot to do, but radiology information system says, you know, I would be interested in knowing about that chest X-ray. And so HIS will take that request and send it to the RIS. And so now we have an X-ray request that's come from the hospital information system to the radiology information system, and it shows up on our board. Okay. Ooh, let's take it one step further. Suppose it weren't a portable chest x-ray. Suppose it were a CT scan. Same thing is true. Radiology information system recognizes that it's a CT scan. So they won't send it to general radiography. They say it's a CT scan. So I'll send it right to the CT scanner. And it shows up on the scanner itself. This is the paradigm of the modality work list. For all of the portable chest x-rays and all of the general radiography work, that's going to show up in one specific area, whereas CT specific or MRI specific or ultrasound specific, that will show up in those areas. And that's the intent of the modality work list. Same thing is true on the other side, taking that, uh, taking that report and um, dictating it and transcribing it into a written format, then that can also be sent and archived uh, or identified in the radiology information system. So we can bring up old reports if we need to. So radiology information system holds all of the radiology specific patient data. Hospital information system, well, that knows everything about you. All the patient information is stored in a hospital database. As long as the database server is accessible to the hospital intranet or the internet, the patient information can be accessed from a number of locations, any number of locations. All that's needed is a user ID and password to get access to HIS. Now that's both a blessing and a curse. And it's a blessing because um, we can check in or make orders for patients by virtue of accessing our hospital information system. However, if we can do it from the outside, then anybody can do it from the outside if they have a user ID and a password to get access. And in these days of uh, protecting digital uh, data and um, maintaining the integrity of patient uh, protected health information, it becomes a security risk. Um, you certainly wouldn't want um, your personal health information to become available to anybody who wants to view it. And so from that perspective, there needs to be a certain amount of security uh, based around these systems. And that's why uh, information technology maintaining um, 
our systems and the integrity of our systems and the security of our systems has become a big deal in the healthcare industry as well as other places. When um, And so for those of you who um, are coming through the program and perhaps you have a background in information technology, then a potential uh, future job for you is in internet uh, PACS analysis and or maintaining these systems. Just planting a seed here for a little bit further along in your career, um, you know, this is another place that you might be able to go. In any event, when orders are placed in the HIS, those orders show up on the modality on the work list in the appropriate area of the hospital, like in radiology, like specialized diet is going to be taken up by the uh, dietary uh, system. <clears throat> and and so forth and so forth. All right, what else do we have? The electronic medical health record. And this corresponds with the hospital information system. This has all of the patient's medical records, including lab results and radiology and pathology results. It has the nurses and the doctor's notes. It has access to our picture archive communication system. So seamlessly, we can, in fact, bring up our x-ray images. Not only that, we're not the only ones who contribute images. Uh, there may be clinical photographs. There may be photographs taken at operation, for instance. There may be dermatology images to show that nasty uh, poison oak rash that you have, both uh, when you presented to the emergency room and six weeks later after your course of uh, skin salve and antibiotics and whatnot. Uh, is over. And so we can store all of that kind of stuff on there. Uh, EKGs, uh, for instance, can also be stored in there. So um, this interfaces with most all of the ancillary service systems to retrieve reports so that they can be viewed in one common format. So you have uh, access to the patient in totality on the electronic health record. And you as the consumer, you as the patient, also have access to at least some of that. And this, as I said, can be interfaced with Picture Archive communication system. That being said, take a breath. We're going to end it now. I want to encourage you. Uh, we've been talking about the content specs for 2017. And on the last page of the content specs, I'm going to assume that you have access to it. I want you to call attention to attachment C, the ARRT standard definitions. And these are the definitions of these terms that I have talked about. <clears throat> and when the ARRT National Board Certifying Exam asks you questions about this material, these are the definitions that they are using. So it would be well worth your while to be aware of these, to understand what the ARRT talks about. For instance, um, in contrast, the difference between long scale and short scale contrast. What is exposure latitude? What is spatial resolution? I think that this is a really important thing. Your time would be well spent studying this document and understanding so that when they talk about digital radiography, the difference between CR and DR. Not that Christy and I and Mark and Therese have done a poor job explaining this stuff to you, but this is going to give you that critical edge. That being said, it's been my pleasure uh, recording these three uh, videos for you in digital imaging. And I look forward to, I think it's going to happen next week or at some time in the near future when we're going to have a live lecture. Uh, and at that time, uh, we'll go through and we'll talk about some of the other aspects that I haven't hit. And be aware that I have a list of all your names and I haven't seen you guys in many months. So I'll be asking you questions along the way um, and looking forward uh, to that occasion. As always, any questions on this stuff, please email me and you know that I will respond to you very quickly. Thank you for your attention. Um, I hope that this was valuable for you and I look forward to seeing you on the live lecture 
here in um, whenever that is. Bye for now.